everybody knows everybody here. So it's Bill Ackman from P Pershing Square, uh, Jonathan Gray from Blackstone, and, and Joe Harvey from Code and Steers. Everybody, so we don't need any further introductions, so we, we will start. They're all very distinguished. Uh, core assets have been on fire. We've had continued uh, compression of uh, unacceptable returns, and cap rates have come in quite substantially. And m most of those investors do not employ any leverage at all, or if they employ leverage, it's very, very modest. So let's start. My question is uh, for jo John. We'll start off with uh, John. As core investors have driven down their expected return hurdles, and Boston Properties have just raised a new uh, opportunity fund, can you get the same returns you've gotten in the past? Well, look, uh, our business, fortunately, is not buying core real estate, which has definitely gotten more competitive. And that's a function, of course, of very low interest rates. If you're a CIO out there today and you're faced with a 0% short rate and a 2% 10-year treasury, uh, a 5% yield on a piece of real estate doesn't look so bad. You've got sovereign wealth funds who are looking at inflation and trying to move from bonds to hard assets. You've got REITs who are focused on core real estate. So there's an awful lot of capital on that side of the table. Uh, what we like is the opportunistic space. And the reason we like it is because there's still a fair amount of distress left from the 0507 period. If you go back, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of loans were originated. If you look in the CMBS market, something like 40% of the 0507 loans are in some form of distress. Those loans need to work their way through the system. Those assets need to be recapitalized. And we've been aggressively focused on that. We put out more than $13 billion of equity in the last two and a half years, all around those kind of situations. So you've got a lot of distress. And then on the flip side, unlike the core world, in the opportunistic world, most of the competitive landscape was financial institutions who, for a variety of reasons, are no longer in the business today. So the number of people who can write really large checks to clean up broken balance sheets, we bought Centro's U.S. assets last year for $9 billion. There wasn't a whole host of competitors to do that. So limited number of people to clean things up, a lot of distress out there, and then the supply picture. I think it's a little better than people realize. We can talk about it later. But what gives us confidence is the fact that no one's building new buildings. And if you can buy hard assets at big discounts as a result of this distress and believe a little bit of economic growth in the face of limited new supply, I think you can generate pretty good returns. Okay. My question uh, for Joe is, is many of the leading REITs own core assets. And the returns on core assets have come in quite a bit. Is it logical for real read investors to lower their return expectations uh, just as the institutional world has lowered theirs in the face of the uh, low rates? Well, I, I, it's, it's very logical, and in fact, it's, uh, it's happened. Uh, you know, REITs today are trading at a, a, a slight premium to what we believe their underlying real estate and net asset values are. Uh, if, if you looked at a, a, a dividend discount model to try to uh, uh, look at what the long-term returns uh, potential would be you're, you're in the eight to nine percent range. So as interest rates have come down, uh, you know, REITs have repriced uh, to, to reflect that. But I think the bigger story is that uh, you know, REITs have, have, have deserved to be repriced because they've really proven themselves uh, over a, a, a long term. And and uh, one of the most interesting uh, dynamics is how REITs have gained uh, market share compared with uh, the private market. Because when you stack up the returns of, of REITs and, and think about the, the liquidity and the quality of management uh, that you have, uh, the returns have far, far out exceeded what what uh, the institutions have gotten. And I don't care about past. I don't care about past. We're talking about the future because and the past performance is no guarantee of future results, as they say in every prospectus. Let's talk about going forward from today's price structure. Well, they, 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 as I said, they're, 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 they're priced, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think commensurate with, with uh, where, where core assets are priced in the, in the private market. Okay. Uh, for Bill, you play in lots of ponds. You don't only play in U.S. real estate. You also play in the corporate sector. You play internationally. Uh, how attractive is U.S. real estate compared to your other opportunities? So, so I, I guess I like to say I don't really deserve to be on the panel because I'm not really a, uh, a real estate guy like the purist to my right, but uh, the benefit of that is that we don't, we only invest in real estate if we think it's, a, it's an interesting interesting time. But um, personally, I invest in real estate. 
Um, and so I get a little bit of perspective from that. And of course, we look at the, the public landscape. You know, I would say the REIT sector generally is not something that we spend a lot of time looking at. We're looking for the, the one-off special situation where you can put a lot of, a uh, lot of capital. Um, you know, I think it's interesting about real estate. People complain about pricing, but I see very smart people doing great deals in New York City, which I think of as you know, obviously one of the most competitive markets in the world. And if you can still do great deals in New York City of significant scale, um, then there's, a, there's always interesting stuff to do. So I think it's a bit of a, you're giving up if you say that, uh, you, know, the, you know, I think if you're going to buy some core asset marketed by an investment bank uh, that's fully leased and there's no work to do, you're going to pay a big price, but there's lots of distress or interesting opportunities that someone, I do, the, I do real estate part-time with my dad, and part-time we've done a lot of interesting things in Manhattan uh, and in Philadelphia, um, and so if we can do it part-time, the full-timers can find things to do. I think the biggest issue for REITs is that they're no longer, or they're not really designed to be opportunistic entities. They're really designed, my perspective, almost like the mutual fund industry where they've, they've built certain specializations, they build a portfolio of class A New York office buildings or uh, class A apartments or you know, pick your you know, industrial assets, allowing an investor to build a, an indexed portfolio. And I think that's a, that's a much more attractive, you know, stable place to put capital than a, a lot of other alternatives. But it's not a place where I think it, it's, it's hard to get the kind of returns that we want uh, to deliver to our investors. So I think it's a very good strategy for an uh, individual or for someone looking for diversification. I think it's a hard strategy at today's valuations to make a fortune. What kind of returns are you looking for for your investors? I mean, high. I mean, we've, we've delivered. High, well. Okay. Yeah, high. <laughs> <laughs> high. Okay. You know, we're, we're unlevered. We keep, we've had 18% of our assets in cash. We charge our investors one and a half and 20, and we feel like, after, you know, you gotta get, leave them something meaningful in order to charge that much. Uh, so if we can't earn a high return, I, you know, I, think, you know, I think our average return on invested capital over the last eight and a half years is like 36%. That's, that's, that's a big high. number. So it's got to be something really attractive for us to put money to work. Okay. Uh, in, in the REIT world right now, there's a whole bunch of discussion of companies uh, attempting to improve the quality of their portfolio, and they're buying and developing high-quality assets and, and divesting uh, non-core assets. So the John is, you've taken the other side of that trade, making acquisitions and higher yielding assets like shopping centers, suburban office, industrial. Uh, so can you comment on why you're on the other side of the trade? And also is, is a repeat, is a read IPO an exit strategy for you? Sure. Um, I think when you go through a financial crisis like we just did, investors got badly burned with a lot of things, particularly commodity real estate. They make decisions, and it's not just true in real estate, but in other asset classes, that some assets are good and some assets are bad. So Bill made an investment in J.C. Penney's, the department store business, which is a challenging business, but he bought in at four times EBITDA. And so, and there's operational upside, and I think he's made a terrific investment. I think analogous uh, to this in our world is some of the commodity real estate. Everybody has decided that owning core real estate in the best markets is the strategy to have. And as you've heard, what that results in is prices going up a lot, cap rates falling. So we said, well, if I could buy strip shopping centers or warehouses or even suburban office buildings, and I could buy them at 8% cap rates or higher in some cases, if I could buy them on cap rates on occupancies that used to be 94 and I could buy them 83 to 87% occupancy, so my implied value per square foot was 30 or 40% below physical replacement cost. We bought Centro's assets at $100 a foot, and we bought some office buildings from Duke Realty for 100 bucks a foot, and warehouses for the low 40s. At those kind of prices per foot, where we're buying at high yields, we're borrowing at, call it, five-ish percent, we're getting a nice running yield, we don't need to believe a lot, and no one's building any buildings, which I mentioned before. And just to put that in context, in, in the U.S. today, Michael Billerman, who I see, does a chart that shows annualized new starts, and it's right around 50 or 60 basis points, which I would argue is around obsolescence. So you've got a $15 trillion U.S. economy. It's adding 2 or 3 percent in GDP. It's adding, call it, 3 million human beings, 2 million new jobs, and it's not building any new buildings. 
and even commodity real estate in that kind of environment begins to recover. And we see that in our portfolio today. We see same store releasing spreads up seven or 800 basis points in our retail centers. We see occupancy growing even in places like Atlanta and Chicago and Dallas. If you don't build any buildings, good things start to happen. So I think investors look at the world today and two or three years ago they said, you know, Washington DC was the only safe place. And then it was Washington and New York and now it's maybe the coast. At some point, I think they'll get comfortable saying, at a pricing level, I can own more ordinary real estate, particularly in this kind of environment, and that's what's given us the confidence to invest. Uh, is a read IPO the exit strategy or selling it to somebody else? Well, look, for everything we own, you know, we'll think about multiple options. So we may sell, in some cases, individual assets. We may sell to public companies. We announced, I guess, a couple weeks ago with Glimpshire, our partner, we sold them all for $350 million in Hawaii. Um, you'll see us sell some assets and portfolios and merge with existing public companies, sometimes cash, sometimes cash and stock. And then there will be IPOs of some of our holdings, just by virtue of their size and where we think we can get the best execution. Uh, I, was, uh, I was on a panel uh, in, in Chicago yesterday, and the night before there was a keynote speaker, Nybard of Area of Property Investors. And he made a flat out statement. He said, suburban office buildings is a sucker bet. And he used the, he made the following analogy. He was involved with my namesake company, Shulman Development Company, which developed office space all in 287 in Westchester County. And in 1988, he was leasing the building there for $23 a foot with $6 expenses. So his net rent is 17 bucks. And you go in the market today, rent is 23 bucks. Expenses are 13, net rent's 10. So after 25 years, you've gone from 17 to 10, a great investment. So is, is this a sucker bet? Well, we obviously don't think so. Uh, you know, part of it, again, is price. I mean, the okay, buildings okay. we're buying okay. traded for as much as 200 bucks, and we may be buying them for close to $100. And I again go back and look at the supply picture in these markets and the fact that if you look at the returns, what we're believing, basically, we get more than half of our return just from current income and we're believing very modest assumptions in terms of rental growth or occupancy growth. So I'm not saying suburban office buildings are the same as owning something in West LA or New York City, but at the right price, I think you can make a sensible investment. I think no? actually what okay. Warren Buffett would describe suburban office buildings as a cigar butt investment, you know, okay. not the super high quality uh, asset, but I think, I bet you wouldn't buy suburban office buildings if you couldn't finance them. Right? The ability to finance them with non-recourse debt, earn a very high current return, get back and affect your capital and have an option on the appreciation, it's the option value that's created by the debt that makes it attractive, whereas I think you would buy a Manhattan building unlevered. There's no question that the financing today makes it easy to believe relatively little. So if you said that building is not going to appreciate, those set of buildings, even though they fall in quite a bit of value, and it's not going to go back up at all. Um, you know, in some of these deals, we can generate 13, 14 percent returns between current income and ROE right. with that option embedded. So I think it's a function of what we're believing. I would also say on suburban office buildings, when an asset class falls this far out of favor and nobody wants to put money into it, if there is job growth, I'm not saying in some Midwest cities that may be shrinking, over time those rents Midwest have... Midwest is getting better, by the way. Yeah, well, I was thinking of yeah. Michigan and Ohio and places Cause, where cause, it's very uh, tough. Well, you brought your position in the old, some of the Duke assets, which I think sitting in the Midwest. Yes, we, we got some of those, but what I would say is over time, hard assets revert to physical replacement costs. If you said in our business, how do we think about investing capital, that's what we think about. And these assets have to, otherwise no one will build new buildings. Okay, now, for Joe, are you supportive of the portfolio shift the REITs are doing by going to core? And then the follow up to think about is, is there a place for REIT portfolio owners for secondary assets? Like is there a company structure for secondary assets that would make sense for you? Well, uh, I mean, obviously it's case by case analysis, right? But I, I mean, I, I get uh, very upset when I hear companies say that they're uh, pursuing a strategy because that's what we want to see or they need to fit a, check a box. And uh, I, I think, you know, some REITs have made some bad sales of, of secondary assets. So, I mean, we're, we're all about making money and, and, you know, one of the biggest dis disappointments that I've had, uh, you know, coming out of the uh, 2009 and the recapitalization phase for the industry is, 
you know, REITs had a huge head start on everyone else in terms of access to capital, and that's evolved into having uh, tremendous access to capital at a, at a very attractive price. And uh, I think REITs have the platforms to be oppor uh, more opportunistic. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things with secondary assets is that uh, I think you need two advantages. One is that uh, you, know, you need to know how to buy right, but you need to uh, have the, the, the financing advantage, and, and you need to have the platform to be able to lease the assets up. So uh, I think there are many companies that, that fit that profile, and, and they, they've uh, really not taken advantage of, 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 the, of the lead that they had. Uh, and, I, and I think you know, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, in, in hindsight, you know, uh, you know. You hindsight just, is very easy. Uh, but it, it became pretty apparent that we were going to have a, a cycle where the, the can would kick down the road, uh, but, but that in order to get at these assets, you had to get at them uh, through the debt. And I, I think that REITs had a, a great opportunity to, to assemble teams. Uh, to have that expertise and, and, and go after assets through the debt, and not many have. I think actually part of the reason for that is, you know, the focus on generating quarterly adjusted funds from operation, right, if you buy a defaulted debt security and it's a, you know, a 12-month workout to get to the asset and you can't record any income, right, you're, you're using capital, you're not returning any FFO to your investors, and it's probably a place where, uh, you know, the market doesn't give you credit for it. And my guess is if you've got a management team or if you're reading the proxy, their compensation is based on growing per share FFO each year, uh, it's probably hard for them to make the decision to go out and take a bunch of capital in which they're going to earn zero for but, but, 18 months. But the thing is, is if the company doesn't make FFO for say, a couple of quarters because they're doing something that may be creating long-run value, portfolio manager at the end of the table will shoot the company and sell the stock, right? I completely disagree with that. I mean, you... you <laughs> I, I got some CEOs you, you, you look, you look at the other side of that. You look at how much the, 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 the buy side and uh, it has evolved and how, how deep the, the infrastructure is for real estate security investing. And I, I think that's one thing that's not appreciated when we talk about topics like this or whether you can do an IPO or not. What, what's not understood is that there's significant demand for these types of portfolios all around the world. Uh, many different types of investors, sovereign wealth funds, uh, retail investors in Japan, uh, uh, investors who are looking for real asset strategies. So this is very deep. And relating to that, you have a, sig a, a significant uh, buy side infrastructure, smart people who know how to, who know how to figure these things out. And, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, one of the, the, the negative aspects to meeting groups like this is that you tend to foster group think, and uh, you know we're we're you know we're, we're smart. We, we can we can figure out what what, what value is and, and 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 are patient enough to invest with with management teams who who are willing to take a step backward to take a step forward. I think we should ask the panel in the corner of the room to maybe not end their conversation. <laughs> Uh, one of the reasons uh, interest rates are extraordinarily low right now, 2% for the 10-year Treasury, 3% for the 30-year, is that some folks believe that we're Japan, or if we're not yet Japan, we're on the road to being Japan. And in Japan, when rates got to 2%, people thought that was the bottom, and then six years later, they were 1% on the JGBs. So the question is, is, is the message of the bond market telling us is, is, is that there's a long-run deflationary risk out there which, which will, might really upset a great deal of pro-formers that people are investing on now. Bill? Uh, so I'd make the opposite case. I think we've had a, you know, a couple, two and a half percent GDP growth in a world in which we're in a housing depression. And I think that is changing real time, uh, everything from anecdotally to, you know, I'm, I'm chairman of the board of the Howard Hughes Corporation. We own Probably one of the largest owners of residential lots. We've seen real activity in terms of builders actually signing contracts, taking down lots. A um, friend of mine in, uh, in Cleveland uh, put his house in the market and he signed a contract to sell it. Um, you know, things like that are actually happening. Uh, and I think if, in fact, uh, the housing market is recovering, which I think it is, um, and there are lots of good reasons for why it should happen, I think you can actually see a, a much greater... Uh, much faster growth in the U.S. Than, than people are anticipating. And I think, you know, the problem with Japan is, you know, kind of dysfunctional governance. 
uh, in a, well, an we, unwillingness we, to well, recognize we, losses? We, we, are um, making, we are making some attempt to prove that we too could be very dysfunctional in our No question, but I think, but still, if you look at Japanese uh, corporate governance and you compare it to here, and you look at the ability of uh, you know, shareholder influence versus you know, the Koretsu type system, I think we still have a system which heals itself much more quickly uh, than Japan. So I don't think we're Japan. I think we're gonna have a housing recovery, and I think we're more likely to have inflation uh, than deflation. Okay, John, let me take, let, if we take the other side of that, and let's say we're gonna have a housing recovery, and if we get a housing recovery, we'll get another, another extra percent at least to GDP, and then we get higher rates, and say, let's suppose interest rates normalize a lot quicker, and, and we go from 2% to 4% in like six months. Because when the bond market moves, we all know it moves much faster than we, have, we can imagine. It just moves much faster. It doesn't move the way it does in econometric models. So what does that do to cap rates, financing, and, and the whole apple cart right now for the pricing structure in, in real estate? Yeah, I, I would say it's a oh, function. Joe yeah. also oh. afterwards. But you, you, John, you sure. go first. Sure. I, you know, the movement in interest rates, it's, it, I think it's a big function of how it happens. So if you take a different scenario, if we had an Italy-type situation where rates run up and you have a contracting economy, I think that's pretty difficult for almost every asset right. class, treasuries, stocks, real estate. If it's as a result of growth, I think you've got some cross currents there because what you'll see in an environment of limited new supply, I think you'll see occupancies and rents increasing, which will be beneficial. On the other hand, some cap rate pressure upward may be there. I think once again, if you say what's most at risk, if I have a 10-year fixed leased asset, that's most bond-like and, and has the most embedded risk. If I bought a resort hotel whose income was down 80%, who may benefit greatly from this, or if I bought an empty office building that I thought I'd lease up to a 9 or 10% yield, and so I have a big spread relative to where I'm going to sell it, I think you've got a little more cushion. So risk return wise, if rates move a lot as a result of growth, the more fixed income oriented assets are more vulnerable. And obviously, shorter lease assets, hotels and apartments do better, I think, in that kind of higher interest rate, higher inflationary environment. Okay, Joe? Uh, first, I agree with Bill on the, on the macro. And uh, I'm a little more bullish on uh, the residential uh, part of it. I mean, this, this is happening already. Uh, I think one of the biggest questions for real estate investors today, if you play the probabilities and, and, and say that you know, we're looking at higher uh, rates, a uh, you know, high yield, yield curve over the next five years, you know, how does that affect your, your investment strategy? I think that's the single big, biggest question that's out there. And I don't have all the answers, but I think I know what you want to own. And, and in one category, it's, it's you, know, you know, property types with pricing power. And it tends to put you into places where there are barriers to, to entry. Uh, and I think there could be another end of the spectrum, too, which, which may ironically take you to some of the, the suburban and the unloved property sectors where you've got a very high cap rate and so you can suffer some cap rate uh, uh, spread compression versus the cost of debt and you have that option uh, opportunity if uh, you know, the, the economy is getting better which would go along with the rising yield curve. Uh, I think that those could, you could have some winners there too. Okay, let me follow up on, on the housing side. Let's say, say single family starts doing a lot better. And we're also in a world right now in multifamily where you could make up anything you want for a pro forma and, and probably get it because the property type is so hot. Can you see a situation, say, sometime in 2013, where housing is back to, say, a million starts? Multifamily is very strong in terms of starts, but people are finally moving out of apartments into single family, and, and all these pro formas blow up in the middle of 13. Can you visualize something like that, anybody? Absolutely, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that, is con you know, that, that, I, that I'm most concerned about is you're already seeing development in apartments and you're seeing it by uh, 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 commercial uh, players, right? Office owners who are now you know, great apartment developers. And I, I think that's one of the, one of the you know, most important warning signs you, you should look at. Uh, but it's still, I think, early in that in that cycle. But there are a lot of a lot of uh, factors that that should start to you know, cause some some uh, yellow flags in apartments. You know, one is the affordability of single-family homes. Uh, second is increasing uh, uh, development. So, uh, and the, and you have a comment on higher that? taxes. 
right? And the benefit of the, mor the mortgage interest deduction is one of the most valuable subsidies that we, we give in America, probably the biggest uh, to, to the typical man on the street. And if you look at the relative, I mean, the reason why people haven't bought homes is if you're concerned you're going to lose your job and you're going to have to move to another market, you're not going to buy an at home. Once the unemployment rate comes down low enough, and I think we're at pretty close to that fulcrum point, uh, it makes a lot of sense to buy a home. And the relative affordability when you know rental rates are compounding at 8 or 9%, Housing prices are down 50 percent, or 30, you know, 35 to 50 percent, and then, you know, interest rates. You know, the 30-year mortgage you can borrow under four, I mean, that's probably also down 30 or 40 percent. So the only thing that's going against you is probably real estate taxes, which are deductible. So I just think, um, and people are, you know, uh, two years ago I put out this little paper saying people should, investors should buy homes and rent them out, and we're seeing a lot more of that activity now. There's a, I just got a copy of a prospectus on my desk. You know, FBR is raising a 300 million dollar. Uh, REIT uh, for someone to go buy homes and rent them out and uh, you know it's a 9% yield proposition in, in a lot of markets um, and I think that will help another another thing that will assist the housing market from recovering. Zelle I think is doing some substantial things in in uh, buying single family homes and renting them out so it's, a, it's an interesting asset class. John do you have a comment? I agree. I hate to agree with everybody but uh, mm -hmm. look I think housing is simple math. It's no different than the commercial real estate. Uh, we are adding a million one households and between um, multi and single family net of obsolescence it's like a half a million new units so we're short 600,000 units there's an overhang of two to three million homes and at some point this market will come into balance and when it does like all hard asset classes it'll revert back to replacement costs people will start building again so I think as individual investors, the challenge, of course, institutionally is how do you execute on that to take advantage of it. But as individual investors, I do think it's a good time to buy single-family homes in the U.S. You buy lots. Yeah. Right from <laughs> in, in Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, Sam Zell. Lots. Yeah. Sam, Sam Zell is going to close. Is going to close the conference uh, uh, today. At the beginning of the modern read era, said bigger was better, but he, he backed away with that from that in an article on Equity Office earlier in the year uh, in New York Times piece. Now my question is to Joe, is bigger, is bigger better? And also in the light of what Steve Roth said. Depends on whether you're talking about real estate or other things. <laughs> real estate. Real estate, okay. Joe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose there's a, there's, a really, there's a great efficiency curve on, on how, how uh, you know, how, how, how big you should be, and there, there's a, you know, there are a, lot, a lot of diminishing returns uh, applies, but, you know, we're, we're focused most on, you know, how, how profitable you are rather than how big you are. Uh, but, but I think the, the, the answer is, you know, generally uh, size works against you in terms of creating value. Uh, you know, the bigger the, the, the denominator, the harder it is to, to make money, but it, it very much depends. If you look at uh, Simon Property Group, the, the biggest REIT that's out there, they're in a, in a sweet spot right now that's, that's incredible, and it's because they focused on uh, generating uh, or creating a port platform that, that generates great internal growth. And you know, they, they, over time, they worked on it. They paid the price by buying a lot of low cap raised assets. They went into another business, the outlet center business. And uh, as a result, you know, they have terrific internal growth. Uh, and, and they're in a great position to acquire and add to that uh, in, internal growth. So, you know, there, here's a situation, and it's unique to that business, too, the, the well, shopping economies, center business. There are economies where, of scale where there, in the mall business. Are, and it, 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 it crosses borders as well. And, and so you can't generalize about that uh, question. It depends about, on the business. Let me ask you, is, is Bornado too big? Pardon me? Is Bornado too big? Again, again, I, I think it's. Um, you know, I think they lost. Steve said the, everything's on the table, so you could you could comment. Yeah. Look, they, they 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 made some investments that haven't turned out uh, uh, as 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 well as they should. One of the one of the downsides, the size, I think you lose some of the focus on on maximizing profitability and return on equity. Uh, uh, I, I thought he wrote a great. A letter on his annual report, and, and they're, 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 I'm confident they're going to fix it. You're being a chicken. Actually, I'll give you an advertisement for John. I mean, I, I think that okay. if you're, uh, I think scale is a very significant asset if you're a private, real estate private equity fund. I mean, I look at, uh, you know, the number of people willing to invest a billion and a half dollars of equity in a transaction is in a very small list. And you would think, you know, sovereign wealth funds or pension funds have a ton of assets, but even the big sovereign wealth funds 
writing a check of more than $500 million, it's kind of like a psychological uh, sort of barrier. And, uh, you know, Centro, I sort of watched the transaction happen, was not a particularly contested uh, deal. So I think that there is, you know, if you look at the real estate private equity space, there are very few players, you know, you have an asset class that's enormous, and there are people that need to move big things. And I, I just think that uh, there are real scale economies and uh, inefficiencies. So that's my pitch for the Blackstone Real Estate Equity Fund okay. Okay. You know, let me, 12 let me, or whatever it's thank called. Thank you, Bill. Let me have, follow up on the pitches. You've raised $10 billion for seven, and you may raise a couple more billion. I don't know what you could talk about or what you can't talk about here, but what's the mission for the new fund? Well, I think the mission is what I've been talking about, which is continuing what we've been doing, which is buying assets related mostly back to the 05-07 period. We've been doing lots with banks. We bought from U.S. financial institutions. I think Europe is very interesting. We haven't talked about that, but clearly in Europe you've got banks who've got two and a half trillion dollars worth of real estate debt on their books, and they're going to have to reduce the size of their balance sheets. So that's going to create interesting opportunities. Obviously, Europe has economic challenges, but once again, if you can get into hard assets at big discounts to replacement costs, we think it's interesting. So I would say it's generally dealing with over leveraged assets from the banks over leveraged assets bought from by real estate private equity firms. Uh, we've seen a number of both U.S. companies, Australian, Israeli companies who've decided to focus back on their core businesses, which is creating opportunity. And as Bill said, there's a real advantage for us in being able to move in size and scale. So I think you'll see us this year alone, we've already put out 2.3 billion of equity. Um, we're really focused on the same kinds of deals we've been doing the last few years, and I still think um, in the U.S. and Europe, it's going to take a number of years before we clean up everything associated with 0507. I mean, I mean, I mean it's a question for you. I want to follow yeah. up with, with yeah. that for you, Joe. Is, is, uh, Simon made the big acquisition in, in France, you know, taking a partial position in Clapier. Uh, DDR is in uh, Brazil. Uh, Boston Properties is presumably buying a building in, in London. What, how do you react to U.S. REITs venturing significantly outside of the United States? Uh, significantly, you know, I think you have to be uh, a little, little suspect of that, but uh, I mean, as it relates to the topic of, of Europe, for the first time, and I think in all of our histories, uh, U.S. companies can access capital and, and deploy it accretively in, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, historically, cap rates have always been uh, way too low for, for companies to, to, to do things. Uh, I, I think Europe is a significant opportunity uh, in, in, the, in the category of securitization. And uh, the, the companies there are shrinking as a part of the, the global market capitalization. There are a lot of reasons for it. Uh, the, the, the management teams haven't done a great job. They haven't uh, earned their cost of capital. As a result, the, the companies traded discounts. They have a very backwards way of uh, raising equity, and that's uh, to do it through rights offerings. And uh, interestingly on that topic, I think Simon took advantage of, a, of an arbitrage opportunity to access capital here in the U.S. at unbelievable rates and in massive size and uh, uh, take advantage of that opportunity. I think that you can, uh, Blackstone has a, an opportunity to create companies in, in Europe and arbitrage uh, the, the, that with the public market uh, and create something that doesn't exist. I think there are alpha opportunities in that in that trade. I think the same thing, and you know, we'll see if, if they're doing it, but I, I suspect they will, same opportunity here in the U.S because of, when you get back to the topic of size, the depth of, of, the, of, the, of the buy side in, in, in the U.S. today is so significant, uh, it would allow uh, Blackstone and others to uh, do what private equity does, and that's move back and forth between the private and, and the public market. And, and in your global funds, are you over or underweight the U.S., over or underweight Europe right now? Slightly underweight U.S., slightly underweight Europe, overweight Asia. Okay. The next question on European investment is, uh, is the election in France coming up? Would that, does that impact your decision making if Francois Hollande beats Sarkozy? No. Okay. <laughs> Warren Buffett has told us uh, that the reputation of a business is sometimes much more important than the reputation of a manager. So that a, you don't need a great manager in, in a good business. And if you have a bad business, a great manager may not do all that much for you. So speaking to J.C. Penney, you have a great manager mm -hmm. in Ron Johnson. The question is, is J.C. Penney a good business or a bad business? Sure. Uh, so the answer is uh, there are better businesses than J.C. Penney, and there are a lot worse. 
Um, you know, it's, I would say it's certainly somewhere in the middle, but let, let's, if, where is most of the, if you look at the wealthiest people in the world, what businesses do they own? The answer is they own retailers, right? Walmart, the Walton family is, as a family, probably the wealthiest family in the U.S. You look at a company like Uniglo, you look at Inditex, you look, you find, a, you know, find a country, pick it, there's a retailer uh, that's owned by a wealthy family, and uh, so if you get the, the box right, and you can replicate it nationally and globally, you can build the most profitable and most valuable businesses in the world. So the answer is, done right, the retail business can be a phenomenal business. I think JCPenney has been a me mediocre company for 20 years, uh, and I think Ron Johnson is gonna change that. And uh, so what, what, when Ron Johnson looked at the JCPenney story, why was he able to attract him? And I think the answer is, uh, his choices were, if he wanted to be CEO of a retailer, that was his, ultimately his dream, he really had to leave Apple, he wasn't gonna be CEO of Apple, and what's the right platform? We could have started and gone to Kleiner Perkins and a group of VCs and private equity, raised a bunch of money. I'm sure they would have backed him to launch a new retail concept. And in 20 years, I bet he would have made a lot of progress with that business. And I think the way he looked at JCPenney, he said, look, it's a startup. It's a startup that has 18 billion of revenues, you know, billion three or so of operating income. That's after spending a billion three a year on advertising for the last 20 years. It's one of the top 20 advertisers in the US. It owns 40% of its real estate outright. Uh, it, the other 60% at least is for, in generally, very, very low rents, a few dollars a square foot. It has these uh, reciprocal easement agreements, these very valuable uh, contractual agreements with malls that give them all kinds of interesting rights. So the real estate is basically free. Uh, so he's got a cash generating entity with billions of dollars worth of revenue and it makes a lot of money and, it, and basically no net debt. That's a pretty interesting platform to launch a business. The other thing he had is he had a shareholder who believed in him. You know, we own 26% of the company, and I told Ron, you don't need to worry about Wall Street, you don't need to worry about same store sales next quarter or next month, or you need to do what makes sense for the business on a five or 10 year basis. And I think he's making the kind of changes that are very difficult to make in the context of a typical CEO. And there's no other CEO at a retailer, in my opinion, that's gonna go this strategy, even though I believe it's the correct strategy for a retailer. And I think that's a huge advantage for him. And uh, so he's redone the brand, pricing, you know, eliminated or rechanged the promotional strategy, and he's uh, about to change the product in the store. And uh, he's doing a phenomenal job. He's also looking at the cost structure of the business. He announced, uh, I think the company's publicly said that there's at least $900 million worth of cost to come out of the company. And this company, by the way, generates $150 a square foot, $160 a square foot in sales. So I think Ron looked at this, he's okay, at Apple, I'm doing $7,000 a square foot in the same. But it costs more than, the t uh, uh, listen, the worst case, an I'll, iPad uh, costs more than a t-shirt. But, but think about it this way, you, could, you know, worst case, let's just carve out, you know, the 120,000 square feet in the mall, let's just carve out a little Apple store. Let's do $7,000 a square foot, let's keep the rest vacant and we got a, we got, we got a better business. Um, and so he said, look, I can, I can fix this uh, situation. And, and what uh, Mike Ullman did, and I think the best thing that Mike Ullman did at JCPenney is he took Sephora uh, and he put Sephora in JCPenney and he proved that you can open up a full price, high brand retailer that uh, attracts a very broad uh, customer that was not a JCPenney customer. And that little store does 500 plus dollars a square foot and does double digit comps month after month. And Ron's plan is basically to take the JCPenney store and to convert it into 100 you know, plus or minus shops of very high quality brands and where the brand has a lot more control over the way they display their merchandise than they do lost in Macy's or many other stores. That's a very attractive proposition uh, for a very high quality brand. But the problem was the high quality brands didn't want to go into JCPenney because when you walked in, everything was 50% off, 30% off, and you get a coupon and you know there's someone shouting every hour, if you buy this second, I'll give you $10 off. But wait. <laughs> and so yeah. that damaged the uh, no high quality, very few high quality brands want to be in that environment. And so now, because it's fair and square pricing, all that discounting crap is gone, uh, it's a much higher quality uh, perception. He's had an avalanche in terms of people banging down the door to get into the store. And uh, they've actually have an application process now with vendors if you want to be open a JCPenney shop, and he's made a very attractive deal with them. And I think it's a strategy that makes a lot of sense. Now there's a lot of turmoil when you go from the old strategy to the new strategy, and it takes, you know, he's, he's been there since November 1, right? This is a guy who's been there for whatever, less than a, you know, four months or whatever the, whatever the time period is, five months. Um, and we're prepared to suffer the short-term turmoil for what's right in terms of the long-term business. And, uh, you know, so I, I rarely you see an opportunity 
to take revenues from $160 a square foot to some meaningfully higher number, uh, take expenses from a very high level to a very low number, and then you have the benefit of basically free real estate and a brand that uh, has spent more on marketing than almost every brand in the U.S., so it's well known, and if you can reshape that message, you can, you can have a home run. And the implications, I know there's a real estate conference, you know, J.C. Penney is about pretty much in every mall. I mean, they're, they're a big percentage of the mall industry, and they're in a lot of B malls, and they're in a lot of A malls, and they're in some C malls, but they're going to make every one of those malls better by virtue of this store turning around. So I think the implications for the, uh, the, the mall industry are very positive, you know, of course, if he's successful, but we've made a, we've got $2 billion bet on his being successful. That doesn't mean we're right, but we, we, uh, we hope so. <laughs> uh, uh, but I assume you have patience. Turnarounds take time, and even if you read the history of Apple, Apple looks great now, but there were long periods where Apple was, even when Steve Jobs, when he came back to take over the company, was wandering in the wilderness, and it took a long time to make Apple right. So you think uh, Wall Street will have the patience uh, for this? The answer is we don't really care. Um, you know, the, uh, Ron joined Apple, I think the stock was nine. Uh, I think you know, a few months later, the stock was six. Um, now, fortunately, his options are struck somewhere between nine and six, and by the time he left at 500, you know, he, it, was, it was a good outcome. So, by the way, that was, yeah. that was 11 or 12 years later. You know, I think, here's what I would suggest you do. You should take the Apple stock chart from 2001, and you should take the J.C. Penney <laughs> stock chart uh, from the time Ron joined the company and sort of match them up against each other. And then if you want to know where J.C. Penney stock's going to go, just follow the Apple chart. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Look, I, I told you guys the same story, I, you know, it was April of 2009, GGP was 56 cents, and I told the 500 people in the room the stock was going to go from 56 cents to $25 a share, and I was wrong. It's 26 today. If you look at the value of the pieces, okay, ignore what I say. Okay. <laughs> in fact, short it. <laughs> All right, now I got a question. Can you buy J.C. Penney and Conan Steers? Is that in your no. wheelhouse or not? He owns it through his Vornado position. Through his tornado <laughs> position. <laughs> right, right. Okay, let me ask uh, Bill another question. Is GGP, they've had their recovery, they're trading uh, uh, where they are. Still a long way to go from their former luster. Uh, it's taken a while to fix everything. Uh, where do you think they go from here? What's, what's the strategy? For GGP? Well, I think they've done uh, a very good job. You know, we, we stepped off the board when the company came out of bankruptcy. Uh, and at the time, uh, so we, what we did was we took, you know, GGP became maybe the problems of scale that Joe talked about. They got kind of big and they were buying lots of different things. There was a lot of crap lying around in, in uh, excuse the expression, uh, in GGP. Actually, I'll use the expression that John used. You know, we spun off this company called the Howard Hughes Corporation. And while John was working with David as a, as a competitor of the bid, he, he used to call my little Howard Hughes Corporation, he used to call it Shitco. And <laughs> shit, by the way, Shitco has a $3 billion market cap right now. That's, that's a lot of shit. Um, <laughs> but my point is that there's value to be created when you take a company like, you know, General Growth, which was in the master plan community business because they bought Rouse, so they own 7,000 acres in Vegas, and they own the uh, master, you know, a couple of communities in Houston, and they own development assets all over the country. But we took those 32 assets out. We got a great new management team, very entrepreneurially uh, focused, has done an incredible job uh, to date, and I think will continue to. Uh, and making those development assets, everything from South Street Seaport, which was, you know, an asset on the books for $3 million, um, which is, you know, if you think about it, if you look at Fifth Avenue at $3,000 square foot rents, you, you have actually very similar traffic levels at South Street Seaport that you do on Fifth Avenue, except, uh, and you actually have the second best performing Abercrombie, I think, in the, in the whole system, but they're paying, you know, $80 a square foot. That's something very, very wrong with that, so we're going to fix that. Um, but the, so you have that company, and now GGP spun off Rouse, and they took the, uh, really the worst of the assets, and what's left is a company with $500 a square foot in sales, and uh, the opportunity is, you know, for the last, really, certainly the last four years, GGP was in financial distress, or, and uh, didn't make a lot of, uh, you know, when you're in financial distress, you don't make a lot of great decisions, and when it was in bankruptcy, I mean, I, Adam Metz is here, he, he did a fabulous job with Tom Nolan, uh, you know, when, uh, taking the company through bankruptcy, but his principal focus was bankruptcy, and during that period of time, you know, a lot of people took advantage of GGP, and they rented space at very low rents, and we were smart uh, not to sign long-term leases. Well, a lot of those leases are coming up. They're being renewed at much higher rents, and so you have a pure play, $500 a square foot, Class A mall company with uh, run by Sandeep, who's a great operator, 
and they're reletting space and they're redeveloping assets and they're focusing on maximizing the value of the portfolio. You have this very valuable embedded option in the fact that you know, the $15 billion of debt that we extended during bankruptcy, all of that debt is prepayable uh, at uh, face value with no penalty, which is an incredibly valuable asset. Now, at the time we negotiated that, you know, we were, we were uh, financing these assets at 5.5%. You know, if you notice, uh, GDP did a financing of Al Moana. You know, they took out, you know, whatever, a couple hundred million dollars of incremental cash, and they, I think it was like 4.1% 10-year uh, interest-only, you know, piece of paper. Well, there's this huge embedded refinancing option in the company. So there's a, there's a repricing of the leases. There's the repricing of the debt. Um, there's a, uh, just an you know, a much more focused, high-quality portfolio. And I think what Sandeep has not yet really established is kind of credibility in the Joe Harvey uh, uh, community. He doesn't have nearly the, uh, the, you know, doesn't have the track record of David Simon. So there's still a question mark, and that's why I think the stock is still cheap. And I do, I think, I love the Class A mall space. I don't, I didn't keep the Rouse spinoff that I sold because I, I don't love that part of the business. But the $500 square foot dominant, you know, million and a half square foot mall, which owns a market, I think is a very bulletproof asset. A few years ago, and to go back to 2008, 2009, we're in the middle of the crisis. The big worry was all the CMBS that was done in 06 and 07, the roll going to roll over in 12 and 13, and we'll have, there'll be a real crunch time. But no one actually imagined there'd be 2% treasuries, and rolling loans gather no losses in the, in, in, the, in the banking system. So my question is, is this going to, to, to John, is this going to be a non-event, all, all the CMBS maturities, or, or will there be opportunity in, in that environment? You know, I think it's an, not an event in terms of a watershed moment where all this debt comes due at one time. I think it's just going to be what we've been watching, which is as debts approach maturities, they'll need to be restructuring. They've done some extensions, but many times in the trust you can only extend for one or two years. So when you get towards the end, particularly as markets have recovered, outside capital has to come in. So we just bought a hotel in San Francisco. It was owned by somebody that CMBS debt had come due. They couldn't get a further extension. It needed to be recapitalized. We worked with the existing owners. I think you're going to see more and more of that. So I think the pace of transaction activity pick, picks up, but the idea that there's some huge wall of maturities that triggers a big decline in asset values and sort of a run on the bank, that's not what we foresee. We see slow and steady work through of that bubble from 05, 07. In, in contrast, Europe will be a lot different since they have to recapitalize well, everything? No, I, I mean, look, Europe is more problematic for the banks there because they have not sold. In the U.S., if you contrast it, you have a CMBS market, you've got a read unsecured market, right and you have a banking system there. The problem is the capital providers are the banks who also need to slim down. So I do think it is a bigger issue. Uh, the central bank there has provided a lot of the liquidity, which has slowed down any sort of big panic or moment. But same issue exists there, and I think over time you're going to see a lot of distressed assets sold. We bought a bunch of them the last couple of years on hotels and shopping centers, multifamily assets in Germany, and I think the pace of that will pick up over the next couple of so years. more opportunity in Europe than here, then? I'd say big opportunity in both. Um, there, they're probably earlier stage in terms of where we are, and it's going to play out over a longer period of time. All right, questions from the audience? Has to be some, yes, sir. The question is to John, whether the, in Europe, are the assets distressed or the sellers distressed or both? I'd say it's both. Um, we bought a number of hotels recently from uh, a UK bank who'd foreclosed out the partner. The assets were performing fine, but not where they had been pro forma, where the financing was done. Um, we do also, talking to European owners who have other businesses who need to deleverage, so in some cases it's they themselves. And then, you know, operating performance in Europe is tougher. So the hotel business is not performing as well in Europe, for instance, as the U.S. Leasing in some of these markets, particularly the southern countries, there's big contrast today, as you can imagine, between Germany and, let's say, Italy. So in some places, operating performance is really tough. Um, in a place like the U.K., London is actually pretty good. But when you go outside of London, things are much, much weaker. So there's a range of sort of operating performance. I'd say the big problems really along the lines of the U.S. There was just too much leverage against these assets, and that amount of debt is not refinanceable. And so that's going to lead to a need for a large amount of equity to come in to recapitalize those assets. The challenge in Europe 
is, you know, the question posed earlier is the U.S. going the way of Japan. I, I think in the U.S. we're adding three million people a year. Japan's declining by a million people a year. I, I would contend that we're not going the way of Japan. Europe, some of those countries face some really challenging problems, both economically and certainly demographically. And so I think in Europe you have to anticipate low growth and low interest rates um, for the most part. Obviously some of these countries have sovereign risk, but I think you have to anticipate a pretty challenging environment. And so I think it's imperative that your asset pricing reflects that. We just bought as part of a big bank portfolio some NPLs in Italy and our price was single dollar cents on the dollar for the NPLs. Now, Italy's very hard to enforce on, but you have to be very conservative in some of these places, just given the overall economic picture, and there are some regulatory challenges in some of these places as well for folks like us. So I, I would say as a general matter, as investors, wherever there's a high amount of distress and a limited amount of building, those are interesting places to play, and I think Europe fits that bill today. If I could yeah. add on to that, I, mean, I think one of the reasons that distinguishes Europe from a distress standpoint is that uh, uh, equity is not being injected into the system, and the banks are trying to delever by by selling off assets as opposed to raising equity like our banks did here in the, in the U.S. And I, I think we're going to have continued, you know, fits and starts, many you know, contagion in, in Europe until until we raise equity. Uh, you know, and, and that provides an interesting opportunity for, for private equity and, and listed real estate companies as well to help recapitalize the, the, the real estate sector, which is so closely tied to the banking sector. Rafi. So I, I would say that's true for every, you know, retail generally, right? The, the internet is becoming a more and more important force in retail uh, and a more threatening force in retail uh, in certain place, spaces than others. I mean, I think, you know, if you think about Best Buy's business, I think, you know, if I had to have a target on a business where there's a huge threat to the business, who wants to go in and deal with a salesperson on buying a flat screen TV? You know, it's basically a commodity product. It's a pain in the ass. You can't even fit it in the back of your car. Why not just you know look it up on the internet, get the best one, get the best price, not pay sales tax, and have it delivered? Um, what Ron's doing, uh, uh, but you have to pay use tax in New York. I pay my use tax um, in case the AG is paying attention. But the um, <laughs> I always assume that that's the way I live my life. But the um, based on the history, um, <laughs> the uh, of course I lost my complete train of thought. But the so one of the benefits we get with Ron is he comes from Apple. Right now, what's interesting is you would think that a retailer like Apple that sells, you know, the Apple iPhone, you would think, oh, this is a kind of product great to sell on the internet. And Steve Jobs decided to implement a retail strategy after every other computer retailer had failed. And the reality is, uh, built the most successful retailer of all time. And why is that? Well, it's not because they sold the product at the lowest possible price. You can actually buy iPhones and iPads cheaper at Best Buy or Target or Walmart or, or, or you know, other places. People want to buy in the Apple Store because of the experience, because of the environment, because it's social. Uh, I had the opportunity to have dinner with uh, Robin Williams. He met his wife in the Apple Store, right? You know, so it's a it's a place to meet girls. I mean, it's, <laughs> okay, okay. look, I won't get to my whole theory of what drives human behavior, but the the, the reality is there is something to be said for uh, the social experience of retail if it's an attractive uh, experience, and I think. Uh, one of the things that's attractive about apparel retailing, it is one of the categories where the, the social elements and actually you know, trying something on and seeing what it looks like and going with a group of friends or a mother and a daughter, um, you know, there is, you know, there is uh, I think, an attraction to that. You know, Ron is talking about creating what he calls the town square in the middle of the store. I mean, making it a place where you want to go for a reason. But if you're selling commodity product that's you know, delivered for free and you don't have to pay sales taxes, um, you know, I, I'd be very nervous about that strategy. But, but internet, you look at Macy's, you know, their, their internet uh, retail is growing at like 35, 40% per month, some enormous number. They've gotten it right. It's a big driver of the overall same store sales of, of, of Macy's. JCPenney, our internet retail has basically been flat for the last couple of years because we, you know, we had a huge head start because we had this catalog business, but they didn't, the company didn't think about, they took their catalog and put it online as opposed to built a 
internet strategy de novo, and Ron, by virtue of his uh, experience in technology and his relationships in Silicon Valley and so on and so forth, I'm quite confident we're going to have a, a best-in-class website. We have a head start with a billion and a half dollars of, of sales on the web, which is one of the biggest internet retailers already, and that's with a rep website has not not that great. So you can expect to see dramatic improvements online, as well as a uh, and the connection, by the way, between online and bricks and mortar. You, know, you can order online, and then you know what? You don't like it, you can return it to the store. And by the way, that you walk into the store, you see something, and then you end up buying more. That that synergy is a very attractive one. So I think what will happen, you know, when, when I don't know if you can think this far back, but when the service merchandise, I don't know, the catalog stores, you know, you know, one eight hundred number and a catalog, who's ever going to shop in a store anymore? And and catalog retail picked up some percentage of uh, retail sales, um, but it's not going to. You know, not everyone's going to buy everything on the internet. What's going to happen is the best retailers are going to adapt their business models to make an attractive places to, to shop, and they're going to have a companion internet uh, retail uh, that, that takes advantage of the synergies of having, you know, whatever, 1,500 stores around the country or, or uh, that kind of nexus with a consumer. So I'm, I think it's a, p a net positive for certain retailers and the, and the death warrant for, for a number of them. Next question. Like Borders. I guess I'll, I'll, you want you go? go ahead. Sure. I, I, I think there are a couple different questions in there because, because uh, maybe there's, there's uh, you know, what, what type of businesses can you put into the REIT structure and then you know, how can you use the restru uh, restructure to financially engineer something to try to create value? Uh, on that topic, the latter, I think there's been way too much focus and attention put on that. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of that. And I think there are moments and times when, when, when people can uh, effectuate a transaction, but uh, typically uh, the, the idea of separating the real estate from, a, from an operating business where it, it, in many instances is very critical to, to that business, uh, uh, you know, I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, as it relates to putting, putting businesses legitimately into the restructure where it qualifies like American Tower, I think that's, 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 that's terrific. I mean, it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a net present value of tax savings and you know, if it legitimately fits in the REIT structure that, and it's a good business, then, you know, we're all, we're all for it. Let's finish. Uh, so um, in Target's case, it was kind of a unique circumstance in which, uh, you know, they own effectively all of their uh, real estate. It's in very high quality locations. And we came up with a structure that I thought would be extremely interesting to the REIT community uh, and also allow Target really not affect their business. Uh, basically, our idea was to take the land under every store, contribute it to a, a subsidiary, uh, set up a 75-year lease between the land and the real estate and, and spin that to shareholders and create an unlevered, extremely safe, what we call TIP read. It was Treasury Inflation Protected read. It was designed to look like a Treasury Inflation Protected security where the rents would go up by a, a CPI adjustment. We pay rent twice a year on the same days that you get the dividends from your, from your Treasury uh, security. That, uh, what I liked about it is it was a very efficient way for Target to, it, that entity was worth, in our opinion, basically the entire market cap of Target and it wouldn't affect Target's business. It would give them the benefit. You keep all the real estate in the C-Corp where you get the benefit of the depreciation, the, the complete flexibility in terms of modifying their buildings. They get the benefit of effectively you know, paying a deduction for uh, their, their land. And I think you have something that would be the largest cap REIT at the time in the sector and something that would be very, very safe, no risk of. Uh, so I thought it was a unique circumstance. I don't think it applies. There's not another company I'm aware of for which that kind of structure applies. In case of Corrections Corp, there have been some developments in the REIT tax law that may make it possible for a company like Corrections Corp to convert to a REIT without spinning off a separate operating entity. And if you can, if you don't have to change your business, I mean, the mistakes that people make, they enter into some sale leaseback transaction where it looks great for, for 19 years and 11 months, right. and then all of a sudden you lose control over all of your real estate and you're out of business. And I think it's got to be, it's, you know, so I agree with Joe, uh, it's got to really fit to the the business, and if it's a more efficient way to be structured, and you don't have to change the way you operate, it can be an excellent uh, solution for a lot of people. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.